Well, a very good morning to you. Uh, it's Sunday the 28th of February and welcome to St John's Virtual Service. Uh, the, my name's Matt, I'm the Vicar of St John's and St Nicholas in, in the parish of Southbourne and West Thorny and it's just a delight to be able to continue uh, sharing good news with you and the encouragement that we have uh, from God's Word and from, from Jesus Christ himself. So it's uh, really interesting that we're going through the book of Nehemiah at the moment, it's an Old Testament book, and we've been thinking about what it is to rebuild, um, what it is to be rebuilding as the people of God. And of course, because of, you know, what's going on, um, it's good to have those thoughts as well. But I just want to say thank you uh, to everybody who's continuing to help serve the community, share a neighbourly love for one another uh, through the free shop and by looking out for one another, by phoning each other, uh, dropping off the daily updates and all of the things that are going on. It's all part of building, building the work of God here uh, for his glory. So I do thank you uh, for that continued work. Um, we, in a few weeks time, will be Christian Aid Week. Uh, so in order to just sort of help us get thinking about that, I'll post a link I'll do that thing where you sort of poke up there or maybe up there. Somebody will post a link um, to uh, Christian Aid Week. Uh, what's their thinking? I mean, I think a lot of us are concerned uh, about climate change and uh, that's Christian Aid's focus this year. And the impacts of that are, are, are on, on the world and everybody. It's just enormous uh, when you start thinking about how far that goes. So um, it'd be good to be thinking about those things. Um, I also wanted to invite, we've got a couple of little gaps that I've left in the preaching series rota for uh, the next few uh, months. Um, after Easter, we'll be looking at the book of Philippians, when we're going to be going through that in some detail, and I'm really excited about it. Um, so, but if there would be questions um, like that, um, then I think it'd be really good to dig into what um, uh, to what's going on there, what, what, our, what our view might be, actually. What, we, what would help us? So um, if you've got ideas, post them to me at the, uh, at the church uh, website address uh, and, we will, um, and we will sort of take, the, take a few and pray over which ones would be good to go through. So but it's important to apply God's word to our lives. And that's, and that's the theme of today a bit as well, actually, as um, David takes us through Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, we'll be thinking about how does the word make a difference in our lives? Let's pause for a moment and just be still. And as I read these words, let's let God's word speak to us as his children. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. Then I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding and I will keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the paths of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant, so that you may be feared, and take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. Preserve my life in your righteousness. Let's just be still for a moment. Those words can be stay up on the screen. Thank you, Lord, that your word directs us towards finding delight in you. That it steers us away from worthless things and helps preserve our lives. We pray today that we would have encouragement, reminders, maybe new things that help us walk your ways as you have called us to. So pray your blessing upon all of us this morning. In his name. Amen. Well, we know that we have strayed, that we don't always do what we should. Uh, that God's word doesn't live in us in the way that it could do, and we ignore it, even though God has sent his spirit uh, to help us write these words on our hearts. We know that we stray away. So let's pray, come to him, knowing, knowing our weaknesses, the mistakes we've made, but we come in hope and assurance of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. 
We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Well, may the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, now um, it's a pleasure to hand over to Mike and his team, who have prepared for us the great song, Over All the Earth. It's uh, lovely to uh, be able to share with a great team of people. I'm going to ask Andrew Bloxham to uh, read God's word for us this morning and then hand over straight away uh, to David Poulter, who's going to teach us uh, from the book of Nehemiah. Good morning. This morning's reading is taken from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. Ezra reads the law. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon, as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the teacher of the law stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Metatiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah, and on his left were Pedaiah, Meshel, Melchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them, 
and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted up their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shebatai, Hodia, Maasiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Pelaiah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read the book of the law of God, making it and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For well, the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered round Ezra, the teacher of the law, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem, go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olives, and from myrtles, palms and other leafy trees, to make temporary shelters, as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches, and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and with the one by the gate of Ephraim. And the whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua son of Nun until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this and their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning to you all and may I add my welcome to you for joining us for this online service today. Firstly, I would like to thank Andrew for reading God's Word to us this morning. I was somewhat hesitant when I asked him to read because of the list of names in this chapter, but bless him, he had no hesitation in agreeing. At least it wasn't chapter 7, which has well over 120 names in it. Anyway, to begin with, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for all those who have preserved it down through the centuries, and for those who have translated it, so that we have it in our own language. We pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to us from your word this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Today we are continuing our series through the book of Nehemiah, one of my favourite books in the Old Testament. Over the past few weeks, 
we've seen how Nehemiah responded to the news that Jerusalem and the temple were in ruins, and how in answer to his prayer he has been allowed to return to the ruined city. We have seen how the building has progressed, involving all of the citizens, and how they have overcome the opposition and the threats from those who objected to the rebuilding. And this morning, as you've seen, we've reached chapter 8, a most important episode in the life of the people of God who have returned to their city. And our theme for today is The People and the Book. Firstly, though, a little bit of a history lesson, my own personal history. I should have joined the Royal Navy as a very young boy seaman on Tuesday, June 2nd, 1953 as all new entrants joined HMS St Vincent in Gosport on Tuesdays. However, something far more important was taking place that day, and I had to wait another two days to commence my naval career. On June 2nd, 1953, together with my parents and some friends, and with many millions of others, I was glued to a tiny little black and white television set which was broadcasting events from Westminster Abbey. This was, of course, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. And why I mention it is that because the Bible played a very important part in that ceremony. The Queen made her solemn oath, with her, hand right, with her right hand resting on the Bible, which was then presented to her with these words. Our gracious Queen, to keep your Majesty ever mindful of the law and the gospel of God, as the rule for the whole life and government of Christian princes, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. And as we know, the Bible and her faith in God have been an important part of Her Majesty's long reign and we do thank God for her faithful witness. To return to Nehemiah. In chapter 8 of this book, as we've heard from Andrew's clear reading of it, the word of God was extremely important to the people of Jerusalem at this time. They didn't have the Bible as we have, as was presented to the Queen all those years ago. All that they had was what is called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, but very important nonetheless. This episode begins with the people meeting in the square before the water gate, and then asking Ezra, who was a teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the Law of Moses. We're told that both men and women were gathered there, that Ezra read aloud from daybreak until noon, and that all of the people listened attentively as he read. We're also told that when Ezra opened the book, all of the people stood acknowledging the dignity and authority of the Word of God, although Ezra made it very clear that it was God who should be praised and not the book itself. As Ezra praised God, all of the people joined in, responding 
Amen, Amen, and bowing down and worshipping the Lord. I next picture the assembly gathering in smaller groups, as Ezra and the Levites instructed the people in the law, explaining it, and, where necessary, translating it so that the people could understand it. This public reading of God's Word, and the explaining of it, must have come across very powerfully, as it's clear from verse 9 that the people were moved to tears as they realised their failures. Nehemiah, however, seizes upon this opportunity to, to declare that this is a time for the people to be joyful before the Lord. He proclaims that this day is holy to the Lord and orders a celebration and feasting. Do not grieve, he declares, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the people went away to eat and drink, celebrating with great joy, because they had heard the word of God, and more than that, they now understood it. That last phrase is so important that they understood God's word that I will return to it in a little while. On the next day, the heads of the families gathered, together with the priests and Levites, to hear Ezra expounding God's word even further. They discovered that, through Moses, God had decreed that there was to be a festival in the seventh month, which is where they are during the time that we're reading about. During this festival, known as the Festival, festival of Tabernacles, or shelters, the people are to build temporary shelters of leafy branches and live in these shelters for seven days. This is to be a festival, a joyous celebration, reminding the future generations that when the Lord led them out of captivity in Egypt, they lived in temporary shelters for 40 years. That time is now long past. They've returned to their land, to their city. The walls have been rebuilt and so has the temple. But that past is not to be forgotten. So, as we read in verse 16, the people went out and brought back branches and built the temporary shelters on the roofs of their houses, in their courtyards and in the square. Now it really is a time for celebration, not just for one day, but for a whole week. What a wonderful result of finding, reading and understanding the Word of God, the Book of the Law of Moses. As I mentioned earlier, a key phrase for me is that the people understood what was being read. As we've seen, all that they had was the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, and even that was in the possession of the priests and Levites, and not on everyone's bookshelf. What we have today, and what the Queen was presented with at her coronation is so much more. In fact, there is almost too much. What is known as the authorised version of the Bible, or the King James Version, came out in 1611, although there had been other translations of parts of the Bible many times before that. Since then, there have been numerous translations and paraphrases. Some of these have found favour with some Christians, but not others. 
Some of them remained popular, while others seemed to have faded into oblivion. For instance, when I was in college training to be a teacher, I had 31 different translations of all or part of the Bible, and regularly dipped into them for help with writing essays, or perhaps even for writing sermons. Whichever version of the Bible you prefer, I hope that you value it, perhaps recalling those words that were spoken to Queen Elizabeth as the Bible was handed to her all those years ago. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. The people in this chapter of Nehemiah obviously valued it, standing up as Ezra opened the book, lifting up their hands in praise, and then bowing their heads to worship the Lord. That doesn't mean that we have to stand in awe whenever the Bible is read, although that is the practice in some parts of the Christian Church. What we do need to remember is that this is the Word of God, readily available to each and every one of us, but only of value if we take time to read it, to discuss it, and to do all that we can to understand it. Not one of us will ever understand everything that is written here. But that's no excuse for not doing what we can, both individually and as a fellowship, to gain a better understanding of what God is saying to his church through his word. There's a lovely mention in Acts chapter 17 verse 11 of the Berean Jews, who were commended because they received Paul's message with eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Today we have many commentaries, both printed and online, many different study notes and reading aids, as well as our church services, our home groups, and conferences such as Keswick and New Wine. We'll be blessed if we too examine the scriptures, learning more and more about our wonderful Heavenly Father and His Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, allowing His Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us. What we have here is a truly wonderful book, the Word of God. There is nothing else like it in the world. As a fellowship, it would be truly wonderful if we were known as the people of the book. Amen. A word of prayer. Father, we do indeed thank you for your word, the Bible, and we pray that we might study it, learn it, and put your word in practice so that we and others are blessed by knowing you and knowing Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Thank you very much, David. Um, as ever, um, each night on each Sunday evening, we have a little Bible discussion group. At the moment, we're going through the book of Acts. But if you wanted to come with questions about what David has raised as well, that, I'm sure that would be welcome. Uh, it's a good opportunity to chew, uh, chew over these things and, and see how they apply to us, how they might make a difference in being who we are. So um, great opportunities to sort of apply uh, and understand God's word together. Uh, that's, I wonder, 6.30 tonight on Zoom. I'm going to hand over now to Anne to lead us in prayer. Shall we pray together? 
I want to start with a few words written by Charles Wesley. And can it be that I can gain an interest in the Saviour's love? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? This morning we want to say how much we appreciate being able to sing these amazing words and to know that you hear them, O God. We thank you for the people that you have inspired to write the hymns that we use today. And we thank you, Father, that we can sing them without fear and without restraint. We want to worship you, Heavenly Father, for the miracle of your love shown to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to express our thankfulness to you for the way that you have blessed us and for the many times we have used hymns to speak to us. It is our joy to respond to you in this way, Lord, because we find it difficult to know what words to use in response to your love. And so often a hymn has just the right words. As David has spoken about this morning, how precious it is that we have the word of God, the Bible, so easily available to us. How precious it is to read it daily and to hear you speak to us from the words written there. How amazing that Jesus' words spoken so many years ago are just right for our situation today. We can all think of the many times you, Lord Jesus, has spoken into our lives and how we have felt your presence as we have read from the Bible. Thank you that we have the freedom to read such words which are so life-giving. As we look back over the past week, we see your hand at work in many different places. Daily, you have provided for us, cared for us and shown us your love. As we look back over the past week, we can see your hand in many different places and we are so grateful for them. So we are thankful for the many people who work so hard for our good and who have often gone the second mile and even the third mile in order that we might have what we need. Father, we know that the many makes many sacrifices to help the sick and those who are dying. And for the many who work in hospital and care homes, we ask that you will give them what they need to fulfill their important tasks. We are privileged to have such an amazing National Health Service. And we ask, Father, that you will put your hand on those who are working so hard for everyone's benefit. We thank you for the many ways that the media have been able to bring church services to the people, for songs of praise every Sunday, and the local radio service, which is available for us all to hear. Thank you that your word goes out, and we ask that the words spoken might be like the mustard seed, take root and grow. We thank you for the technology that allows us to access the services sent out by St John's and we want to thank you for the work that goes on in the church week by week. We are mindful of the many folk who work so hard in helping families who are struggling to make ends meet. Lord, as the weekly shop is open, we pray that the people who use it will want to know why the church is doing this and seek to know you personally. Heavenly Father, we want to lift to you our world, which is in such chaos and where the basics of life are very scarce for so many people. We ask you to bring about the miracle of compassion, where the leaders of the world will work together to bring about peace and where the leaders will think more about people than about war. The stories we hear are so distressing and we feel powerless to help, but we know we can talk to you about this. Lord, in your mercy, bring about the miracle of truth and justice, where people will follow your words to love God and to love their neighbours. We particularly pray about the inoculations that we have in the West and the countries where little help is given to help the virus be controlled. Help all nations collectively to have a common purpose to do good, to see justice is done and to let 
Britain be at the forefront of that. Lord Jesus, we ask for your touch on all those who are finding lockdown such a struggle, where loneliness is keenly felt and where hope is weak. Help us, Lord Jesus, to seek your face day by day, to have our eyes open to see your hand at work, to be willing to help others and to talk daily with you. We ask that you will be very close to those who are unwell and who fear for their future. Be their rock and their help at this time, we pray. For the coming week, we ask that we will take up opportunities to be kind and helpful, to believe in miracles and to help others see how much you love them. Help us, Lord, to be a blessing to you and to others. Keep our eyes on you and to rejoice that we can sing your praises wherever we are and whatever time of day or night it is. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Father. We ask that you will not only hear our prayers, but will come and answer them in all fullness, because we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. It's a great opportunity, isn't it? That we're going to sing together. Uh, uh, Mike's prepared for us. Uh, Be thou my vision. Great hymn, isn't it? Um, uh, apparently sort of set up uh, as a prayer that uh, knights of a certain age would write and then pin on the inside of their shield to remind them as they headed into into the battle. Well, we head into a week that's got its own challenges, but it's a great opportunity, isn't it, to remind ourselves of, of who is the centre of who we are and how he is calling us uh, to him. So let's uh, sing together, Be Thou My Vision.
Well, I do hope to see you at coffee uh, at 11.15. Uh, Zoom codes are on the, uh, have been given out during the week. Uh, it'd be great to sort of chat, catch up, see how you've all been. Uh, maybe take the opportunity to um, yeah, meet up in our, meet up one another in a, a socially distanced context and pray for one another. But all sorts of things that we can continue to do as we head into this year and this week. I'm going to close with these words of uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Well, stay safe and see you soon.